Why does God allow evil? Well, what if it were the only way for us to be free? What if we couldn't have free will without it? Would that explain why there is evil in the world? Let's consider. Hello philosophers, I'm Chico. Welcome to The Philosopher Show, where we consider the greatest questions of human history. In this series, we've been considering the problem of evil. Why would God allow evil? In the Not Good God episode, we saw that premise two failed because God is not a moral agent like ourselves, so we can't read off a list of things that we would expect him to do if he were good. God is good in an analogical sense. So although premise two fails, now we're considering possibilities for why God would allow evil. Not to reject premise two, that's already been done, but really more for curiosity's sake. Today we'll consider the free will defense. And really here I think there are three important premises. Number one, that we have free will. Number two, that evil is a necessary consequence of free will or of some other thing that we want and we need free will to get. And number three, that free will is worth that evil. I think likely some of you will reject premise one here. You'll think that we don't have free will. Totally fine, but for the sake of understanding this response, let's assume that we do have free will. So we're just gonna assume that premise one is true. Let's evaluate premise three first. We all struggle with some choices. I struggle to eat healthy. I would love to eat Brussels sprouts instead of ice cream, except they taste like earwax. But what if a mad scientist creates some kind of decision-making machine, goes into all of our houses in the middle of night, hooks up a little brain surgery, cuts open our noggins, sticks this little decision-making thing in there and sews us back up so that tomorrow morning, instead of going for those frosted flakes, instead of the fruity pebbles, you go and you get Brussels sprouts. You can't help it, it makes the decision for you. Oh look, you're eating healthy, right? You're doing exactly what you wanted to do. You'd want that, right? Well, most students that I ask this question to say that they wouldn't want that. In fact, they would feel like they've been violated in some way. They want the choice, even though it's a choice just to do something that they don't want to do. And even those students that say that they would want this, I have a sneaking suspicion that if somebody had actually done this to them, they'd be upset. At least most of us would be outraged if we had our free will taken from us even if it were just to give us all the things that we thought we wanted in the first place. So either free will is some important component into happiness, or maybe we just don't wanna let it go. I don't know, but for some reason or other, we think that freedom is really, really important. And we value our free will so much that we're willing to retain it even when it brings us pain. There are also some good things that we think are really, really important that require free will. So for example, my kids love that movie, Big Hero 6. There's a part in there where Baymax, the little robot guy, or I guess he's a big robot guy, gets his programming altered in some way, and all of a sudden he starts attacking, and he starts being a bad robot, and then it goes back to being the normal programming, and he's a good robot all of a sudden, and he says, I'm so sorry for all the bad things that I've done. And you know, deep down in your heart of hearts, you're like, it's okay, buddy, right? It's not your fault. You couldn't help it, it was the programming. But wasn't he just following the programming before that too? Isn't he following the programming now? In other words, if he's exonerated from those evil things that he did just because he didn't have a choice in the matter, then would we laud him for all those good things that he did when again, he doesn't have a choice in the matter? It seems like free will is necessary for moral blame and even for moral praise. The most admirable thing I've ever heard, a good friend of mine from the Air Force Academy, David Broder, Brody we used to call him, a guy came into the Kabul airport spraying an AK-47, he charges at this guy, took nine bullets, died saving you know several lives at least. Incredible courage, right? And, and you wanna laud that person and say what a hero that person is, but what if he couldn't help it? What if he was just following his programming? It might feel like his heroism is diminished because he didn't have a say, he had to do that thing. So free will is also necessary for some very good things like heroism. And obviously it would be controversial for me to say that all evil is totally worth it for just to have free will, just to have this heroism or just to have a choice. But at least you could see why it'd be plausible to some people and boy, it sure would be tough to give up free will even at the cost of, of the, some of the evils that happen in this world. So although that's kind of a judgment call, right? Is it worth it or not? I, I do think at least, I mean, at least if you challenge yourself, that's a tough question, right? Would you give up free will just so that there would be no suffering? I think the premise that's more likely to be debated is premise two, that evil is a necessary consequence of free will or at least of some of the things that we want free will for. The idea here is that in order for us to freely choose good things, we have to actually have the possibility of doing bad things. If we couldn't choose those evil things, then it wouldn't be a choice in the first place. We would just have to do good things. 
or in the case of one of those things that we want free will for, if we didn't have any possibility of being put into danger, then heroism would be impossible. We wouldn't have anything to be saved from. So is it the case that evil is necessary for free will? Some people have objected like this. What if God allowed us to have free will, but just stopped us before we made evil choices and allowed us to make good choices. You can imagine that mad scientist that made the decision-making mechanism. What if instead she makes a brain blocker so that whenever you're going to make a good decision, it doesn't do anything, but when you're going to make a bad decision, all of a sudden it stops you and forces you to make a good decision. You still have free will in the case of those things that you were going to choose that were good things, but just you wouldn't have free will to make bad choices. By the way, this example I got from Harry Frankfurt, I think. It may be obvious though, one of the possible responses here. Imagine a kid that always did bad things and the parents were always saying, hey, I'm not going to let you do that bad thing. If you do that, you're going to get a punishment. And then they never punish the kid or they never stop the kid from doing it. Will that kid ever stop of his or her own volition? Probably not. Probably that kid will still do bad things. And so one reason we might not want a world in which we could choose good things, but then we'd have that bumper in case we choose bad things is that we wouldn't have any kind of personal growth or anything like that. And also people have argued that it would be some kind of violation of free will. That wouldn't be real free will. God would be forcing us to do his will. A harder objection though, I think, is why wouldn't God just make a world in which there are all free will agents and they have the possibility of doing evil, they just never do. So imagine a universe that just pops into existence with only two items, a delicious looking fruit that is immoral to eat and a very hungry woman named Eve. And imagine that Eve comes into existence already with some knowledge that's preloaded. So she knows what eating is, she knows what being hungry is, she knows that eating will satisfy that hunger, and she knows that eating this fruit is an immoral thing. The universe exists just long enough for Eve to make a decision and go through with it, and then it pops back out of existence. This means that there are actually two possible worlds here. In one, Eve uses her free will to eat the fruit even though she shouldn't. In the other, Eve uses her free will to abstain from eating the fruit. She does the right thing. God is all knowing, so he would be able to know these two different possible worlds and he'd be able to pick which one he wanted to create. But that seems pretty simple. So let's add another free will agent. We'll call him Adam. Now, Adam has that same decision. He can eat that immoral fruit too, or he can abstain from it. So now we actually have four different Different combinations here. One in which Eve and Adam eat the fruit, one in which Eve and Adam don't eat the fruit, one in which Adam does but Eve doesn't, and one in which Eve does and Adam doesn't. So there are four possible worlds. However, there's only one possible world in which everybody does the right thing. And of course, you can imagine adding a third possible agent with the same decision. And in this case, there would be eight possible combinations, but only one, again, that has everybody doing the right thing. And in general, for any n decisions that could be made, there are two to the n possible combinations. But again, only one of those combinations where everybody does the right thing every single time. Now, obviously, the number of worlds have expanded exponentially, and yet that one that we want, that desirable one, is still staying the same at one. So it seems like, wow, things are getting really complex. It would be hard to keep track of which one was the right one, the one that we want. But remember that God is omniscient, so God wouldn't have this problem. God would be able to look at all the different possible worlds and say, ah, that one, the one where nobody does anything wrong, that's the one I want to create. So it seems like we can have all number of free will agents, all number of free will choices that are available, and yet it'd still be possible that there is one world in which all of those decisions that are made are the right decisions, and that God would be able to know which one that was. He would be able to choose the world in which every free will agent only used their free will to make good decisions, to make the right decisions. So the objection would go, it's not the case that evil is a necessary consequence of free will. Now there are two possible responses to this objection, neither of which we can really get into in depth in this video. The first of which comes from open theism, which I did cover in open theism and the problem of evil, but I haven't covered in depth. The idea here would be that there's no way that God would know ahead of time what somebody was going to do or not going to do. That wouldn't be a free will decision. That would be determined ahead of time. And a determined decision is not a free will decision. And a possible objection to this is that it's the free will agent herself that's doing the determining here. And that's exactly what you'd expect in a free will choice. But that's a huge debate. And again, we can't really get into that right here. The second possible response comes from the Molinists. And again, I've done a video on Molinism and the problem of evil, but I haven't gotten really in depth in Molinism itself yet. The idea for Molinists would be that some of these worlds that I'm talking about, some of these possible worlds aren't actually possible in the first place. And an objection to that would be, why not? What makes them impossible? 
Seems like they're very possible to me. Do either of these responses work, open theism or Molinism? Unfortunately, we'll have to take some time out in other videos to look in depth at these possibilities. Personally, I think that they don't work. I do think that God allows certain evils for the sake of free will, but I don't think that he had to do things this way just to get free will. I think he likely has additional reasons. A third objection you could give to the free will defense is that it doesn't account for all kinds of evil. First of all, it might account for evil suffered by the person that is doing the evil, but it doesn't really account for evil suffered by the person who is an innocent bystander. So for example, a drunk driver might get injured in a car accident and you might think, ah, just desserts. God allow you that free will and you, you, you chose to use it this way and that's what happens. But what about the person that he hits? A drunk driver hits an innocent bystander, that person wasn't using their free will in any way. So it seems like the good of the drunk driver's free will came at the cost of the innocent bystander, and that doesn't seem fair. And a second kind of evil that free will doesn't explain is natural evils. Now, sometimes natural evils can be exacerbated by free will decisions. So for example, there may be an earthquake and people may have skimped on the building codes. And because of that, a lot of people might die when the building collapses. The earthquake was a natural evil, but the decision not to actually put in the extra money to make these buildings up to code would be a free will evil. But of course, there are a lot more natural evils that can't be explained away in this way. Now, one possible response to this is what we could call the fallen world theory. And that is that the world was initially perfect, but humans make a free will decision to do something evil and that sort of infects the world around them. And from that point on, the world is fallen. So that would explain why there's natural evil, why there's evil that's suffered by people it wasn't their fault, all those kinds of evils. Now, I do think that this is a possibility, but think about this. In the Molinist and open theist response to the second objection, the argument was that free will decisions require the potential for evil suffered by the chooser. And the idea here was that there was a necessary connection between the free will choosing and the choosing of evil. But in the case of natural evils and for evil suffered by people other than the choosers, it's obvious that there is no such necessary connection. So for example, God could have made a world such that it wouldn't get corrupted even if somebody did choose to sin, even if somebody did use their free will to make an evil choice. Or in the case of people who are suffering from evils and they didn't make the choice, well, God could have put each one of us in a separate pocket universe, which was filled up with philosophical zombies, beings that looked exactly like humans, reacted exactly like humans, but were just like cleverly programmed robots that you couldn't tell. They weren't actually making decisions or experiencing anything. They were just programmed to react just like a human would. Then you could choose all kinds of evil and nobody else would suffer from your free will choices. So it seems like these two kinds of evil, natural evil and evil suffered by someone other than the chooser are evils that our free will response wouldn't cover. Which is not to say, by the way, that God doesn't have reasons for those evils. Personally, as a Christian, I believe that God works all things to the good for those who love him. Though I don't think we can know the reason for every single evil that God allows. I do think some of them are for the sake of free will, but the point of these considerations is to show that free will can't be the only reason for the evils that God allows. What other possible reasons could God have for some of these things? Well, don't forget to subscribe and allow for notifications for some upcoming videos where we'll explore some other possible reasons. But again, remember, what we're not doing here is trying to solve the problem of evil. We've already seen that premise two is unfounded. The idea here now is to see, well, what could be his reasons? Please let me know if you have any questions in the comments. Thank you for watching this video on the free will defense. That's all I got for today. Adios.